Happy New Year, Covenant Hope Church. I don't know if you noticed earlier in Pastor Brian's announcements, but there's been a few changes for us here recently with this new year, right? There's been the change of the weekend. We're meeting on a different day of the week than we used used to. Some things we're postponing or canceling. There's been changes to the things we would like to be able to do together, but for the sake of COVID or deciding to kind of push pause on them for a little bit. Uh, There's also a new change because there's a new sermon series starting today. So we'll be looking at a new book of the Bible this week and for the next few weeks. New Year's is a time when we think about change quite a lot, right? Obviously, the change to our calendar, we change the, the date is now, we've got to remember to say 22, not 21 anymore. But some of those changes that we think about around New Year's are kind of more significant, right? We think about New Year's resolutions. We think about changes that we want in our lives in a new year. Change is something that's somewhat inevitable for us, and some of them we want and some of them we don't want. Some of them we can control, some of them we can't control. And so at New Year's, it's a time where we reflect. And so even Hannah and I did this week, we kind of set ourselves some goals, some things we wanted to resolve to do this year. Stuff that we had failed to do maybe last year that we wanted to do and things that we had done last year that we thought, oh, let's not do that anymore. Watching TV during the week or uh, eating fast food multiple days a week, you know. Over Christmas, one of the changes that I want to see is the 10 pounds I gained over Christmas uh, quickly shed off in the, in, the, in the weeks and months ahead. Hopefully, Lord willing. Let's see. But, you know, God's Word tells us that we don't just need a little change here or there. We don't just need to form some new habits and resolve to uh, forget some bad habits or resist some bad habits. No, the, the Scriptures are really clear that we need more than just change. We actually need transformation. We need our relationship with our holy God, to be transformed from one of God's righteous wrath on us because we're sinners and we're guilty before Him, to one where we're received in love and welcomed in and reconciled to Him through His grace and love shown to us in Christ. And so, as we begin this new series today in the book of Titus, that's what this little letter in the New Testament is really all about. It's the It's about the truth that transforms us. That could be a a kind of a summary for the book as a whole, and so that will be kind of an idea that you'll see crop up in different ways throughout this series in this little book of Titus. Before we dive into the book and consider it, um, let's go to the Lord one more time and ask for His help to help these truths transform our lives and our lives together as a church. So, let's go to Him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that You would be with us today. We need Your help. We need Your Spirit to uh, help us to know the truth and to cause that truth to bear fruit in our lives, to transform us, to make us more like You created us to be, to be more like Your Son, Jesus, was and is. And so we ask that You would do that today through our time here in the book of Titus. Use the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts for your glory, for our good. May they be pleasing to you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, if you haven't already, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Titus. It's a short book, just three chapters. It's a letter, in fact, and it's really close to the end of your Bible. It's one of the Pauline epistles, so it's, there's a section that are all Paul's letters, beginning with Romans and concluding with Philemon, and it's almost at the very end. It's the second to last in those books that Paul wrote. 
And it's one of the reasons it's at the end of that series of Pauline letters is because it's one of the shortest letters that Paul wrote. The only, the only shorter one is Philemon, which doesn't even have more than one chapter. But Titus has three, and we'll be looking at that over the next couple months. So Titus, for those of you who aren't aware, is one of what are called the three pastoral epistles. Just some background before we dive into our text today. It's important to know a little bit about these letters and in particular to Titus. So the pastoral epistles were written by Paul to his fellow co-workers, his fellow workers for the spread of the gospel. These uh, men, Titus and the two letters that are written to Timothy, obviously Timothy was also a co-worker. These were written to guys who were working in newly founded churches, newly formed churches in places where Paul had traveled to share the gospel. And so Timothy was dispatched to the city of Ephesus, while Titus was left behind on an island called Crete. Now, Crete is one of, no, is the largest and most populated Greek island in the Mediterranean. Um, And so this letter was written to help Titus, who was serving churches on this island, and he um, was left behind to help organize these new churches. Paul had preached the gospel, people had come to faith in Jesus, and now they were forming into churches, and Titus was left behind to help them organize themselves. And the purpose for them to organize themselves was to help promote godliness amongst the believers there, and to protect them from ungodly influences, from society at large, and from some false teachers that were spreading false truths. Well, that's an oxymoron. They were telling lies, basically. So, Crete is this long, thin island in the Mediterranean Sea. It measures at about 3,200 square miles, but it's dominated by harsh, mountainous terrain that just kind of rises out of the sea. And so, it would have been quite challenging for Titus as he traveled this island, visiting various towns, going to them to share about his gospel and in encouraging these churches to be organized. But Titus didn't only face logistical difficulties as he traveled around. As we'll see in our series, he also faced spiritual challenges as well. These churches weren't yet fully ordered. They weren't organized. They didn't have leadership, and there were false teachers, as I mentioned, that were spreading lies that were upsetting whole households within these churches. And so, it's quite a formidable challenge that young Titus faced, and now he faced it alone apart from his mentor, his mentor Paul. What a mission to be entrusted with, to go around from church to church and help them grow help them organize their lives, help them to grow in godliness, and to protect themselves from unwanted influences. So, this is the context that Paul is writing to, and this is the context in which Titus was ministering. So, this letter remains very instructive for us as a church today. It's very practical. It gives wisdom about how a church should be formed, how it should be structured, who should help lead it, how it can be protected, and how Christians can flourish and grow in their faith and in godliness. It's one of Paul's shortest letters, as I mentioned, but it also contains one of the longest introductions to any of his letters. So, these first four verses that we'll be looking at today, Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, they're they're one long sentence, and it's packed with purpose by Paul. These verses, in one sense, are simply serving as a greeting to open the letter between Paul and his trusted companion, but they also serve to plant the seeds of the major ideas and themes that we'll see throughout the whole letter. And so, let me encourage you, as you study the letters of the New Testament, as you study Paul's letters, don't just skim over the greetings. Take time to carefully consider them because they, as I said, plant the seeds 
of major ideas and major themes that Paul will unpack in the rest of his letters. So let's consider this opening four verses now. Follow along as I read them. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in His Word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. So, as I said, Titus as a whole, but even here in these first four verses, we'll see that these verses are an encouragement to us to trust in the truth that transforms. That's the main point of the sermon today, trust in the truth that transforms. We'll see this unfold as we consider, first, the author of the letter and what he has to say about himself. First, we're going to look at Paul And everything that he says about himself is really the bulk of that text. You see right there, verses 1 through 3 are really about Paul, his apostolic ministry, his purpose in life, his drive. And so that's going to be the bulk of our sermon. But then we'll consider the shorter um, information that we hear about the person who the letter was written to. That's Titus, and we see that in verse 4. So let's look at Paul first. Paul in verses 1 through 3. The first thing that Paul does is he identifies himself by two titles. Firstly, he says that he's a servant of God. And this way of referring to himself, identifying himself, is actually found nowhere else in Paul's writings. Not in any of the other openings of his letters, not in any of the body of those letters, does he ever say that he's a servant of God. Paul does call himself a servant of Christ on many occasions, and even he calls himself a servant of other believers, other Christians. But here, he uniquely calls himself a servant of God. And while it might be easy to quickly uh, fly by these words and think, well, yeah, he serves the Lord, great. We know that about Paul. I think that this expression is chosen carefully, thoughtfully, explicitly, intentionally. This phrase, the servant of God, is the expression that's typically used in the Old Testament to speak to or refer about those people who were chosen leaders of God's people. And so, the servant of the Lord or the servant of God, men like Abraham, men like Moses, men like Joshua and David and the prophets were servants of the Lord or servants of God. What Paul's doing here from the very first thing that he tells Titus and us about himself is that he's reinforcing his role as God's spokesman, that Paul has authority to speak on God's behalf. And then we see he he complements this title with his more common identification as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, an apostle just means a sent one, but it here it's, it's talking about the, the fact that Jesus had chosen Paul to be his spokesman, to be his messenger, to deliver his gospel authoritatively. So, an apostle was chosen by the Lord Jesus as an authorized messenger. So, he's together these two titles are reinforcing the fact that God is speaking through Paul, that Paul's words have the authority of God themselves. And so, if you're here today and you are uh, new to church or new to Christianity, or maybe you've been coming for a long time, I don't know, but if you're not a Christian, we're so glad that you've joined us here today. But I want you to know that when we read the Bible, as we consider a letter like this one, or really any of the Bible, we consider it to be authoritative, to be God's authoritative Word to us. Every part of Scripture is referred to by us as God's Word. 
It comes down to us from God. And so we can't pick and choose which bits we like or we agree with and which bits we don't like or don't agree with. We are being addressed by God Himself as we consider these words. And so they, they have important weight for us in our lives. Paul's making it crystal clear to Titus and to those that he's serving in these churches on Crete that what he has to say comes from God Himself. And so, as we consider it, we're reminded that these are God's very words and that He is trustworthy. And so, we can believe them and accept them too. In fact, we must. With these titles, servant of God and apostle of Jesus, Paul's reminding Titus and us that his mission is one given by God, and this is a message from God. And so, it's worthy of our trust. We should believe this. We should put our faith and trust in it. But what's the goal of Paul's ministry? Well, the rest of verse 1 tells us that. Paul has been chosen as a spokesman for God. He's been chosen as an apostle of the Lord Jesus. What, for what purpose? Right there it tells us, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth. So, Paul's apostolic ministry is for God's chosen people. Paul serves God by serving the people of God, the elect, those whom God has chosen as His own. And Paul honors Christ by caring for Christ's bride, the church. And Paul highlights two of the essential aspects of his apostolic ministry. We heard them there in, in verse 1. He serves for the sake of faith and knowledge. Faith and knowledge. You know, in today's modern society, it's it's kind of in stark contrast to this idea. Paul doesn't see that faith and knowledge are actually incompatible and don't, don't work together. Like, hey, if you want to really believe, you have to ignore all the facts. No, Paul is encouraging us to see that it's vital for Christian flourishing that faith and knowledge grow together. Faith and knowledge grow together. Rather than being foes, faith and reason are friends. We all believe what we do, every single one of us, whether we're an atheist or a Christian or a Hindu or any other thing, we all believe what we do by some element of faith, of trust. We are putting our trust in what we've experienced, perhaps. Or we are putting our faith and trust in some authority of some kind. So, even if you were to pull out your phones now, don't do that, but if you were, and to open up uh, a, an, a news app and read about news that's happening around the world, you are taking those things by faith. You're believing them and trusting in them by faith. You, you can't verify them without going to that place. Or if you read anything in a history textbook, you're trusting that the author is recounting an accurate set of uh, ideas or events or people in that book. Everything that we believe about the past is based on faith in some sense, but it doesn't mean that it's apart from knowledge and truth and verifiable facts. And so, you're, you are always basing what you believe on some, some sort of authority that you're choosing to trust. And what Paul is saying here, right in the get-go, and his whole ministry is seeking to encourage God's people to trust God and know Him more. To trust in the truth that He has revealed to us. To trust in what He's given for us to know. So, Christian faith isn't blind. It's not disconnected from knowledge or truth or thinking or reason. No, they're wedded together. God addresses our minds He's given us a book that we can read and study and think about and meditate upon. And He's given it so that we would grow in knowledge and understanding. So, let me encourage you, if you aren't a believer, or if you are a Christian and you want to sh talk to your unbelieving friends or colleagues, take time to encourage them to consider the claims of Paul and the other apostles 
the writers of the New Testament Gospels. Read the Gospels with them. Ask them, does this ring with, with the authenticity of truth? Encourage them to study it, to consider it, to weigh it, to study the arguments that Scripture makes about who God is, about who they are, about the world around them. Ask that person to, uh, to study the Scriptures with you. Brothers and sisters, also make it your goal, your aim to fuel your faith by having a deepening knowledge of the truth. Don't just be satisfied with where you are at in your knowledge of God's truth laid out in His Word. Whether you've read the Bible a hundred times or not even read it once through, let me encourage you that you can keep studying it and know it more and more. Join Evan and Joella Thibodeau who are reading the whole thing in 120 days. That's quite a lot of reading. It's quite a short time to get through the whole Bible, but it would be really valuable for your growth. Or consider reading it slowly over the course of a year or two. Both are great ways to grow. That's what Paul's ministry was all about, serving the faith and knowledge of the truth of God's people. But what is the result of this faith and knowledge? What result comes from Paul's ministry? Again, we're still here in verse 1. Look at the very last phrase there. Paul tells us what is the result of growing faith and growing knowledge of the truth. It accords with or leads to or produces godliness. And so think about it like a maths equation. Faith plus knowledge equals godliness. Or maybe you could, maybe if you didn't like maths in school, think of it like a science experiment. This is like a reaction. When you combine faith and truth together, they produce godliness. It's like an explosion of godliness in our lives as our faith and knowledge of the truth grow. Christ-like character flows from deepening trust in and knowledge of God's Word and the truth. And this is so important for us as Christians. It's so important for us as a church. And so let me put it in the most basic terms. The truth really does transform us. Knowing the truth and believing the truth really transforms us. The gospel produces godliness in our lives. Paul throughout this letter is going to emphasize this point that conversion leads to a transformed life. It leads to a changed life. Roots of faith always produce the fruit of godliness in Christians. And so it's like Psalm 1 that we read earlier in our service. If you look back there, I think it's page 6 of your bulletins. The man who's blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord. He delights in the truth that God has given him and put in his law. He meditates upon it day and night. And what happens? What is he like? What does he look like? Well, he looks like a tree, a strong, firm tree that's planted by streams of water that bears its fruit in season or yields its fruit and its leaves don't wither. As we know the truth more, as we trust in it more, it will make us firm, steadfast, like a tree. Not like chaff that gets blown away, but a tree that remains and always prospers. It's never withering. It's never fruitless. And so, as we consider what Paul has to tell us about the truth, we must see that the truth is meant to produce godliness in us. So what that means is that as you reflect on your own life, as you consider maybe as this new year and you reflect like Hannah and I did on what are some changes you want to see in your life? What's some sin that needs to change that you want to, you want to see freedom from this year? Well, behind whatever sin it is, whatever kind of sin it is, is a lack of faith. It's a lack of faith in or a lack of knowledge of the truth. If you want to fight sin in your life, you combat it by trusting in the truth. That's what will transform your lives. And so, ask yourself, 
Ask yourself when you see sin in your life, ask yourself, what am I not believing? What is it that I'm not believing that's true that I'm failing to hold on to? That in that moment when I get angry, in that moment of lust or laziness or gossip or fighting, what am I giving in to not believing? What do I not trust that God has said is true in my life? Because genuine faith in the truth always leads to godliness in our lives. And so, Paul goes on to share that this gospel transformation, this change in our lives, it takes place in and it rests upon the hope of eternal life. We see that in verse 2. In the hope of eternal life, which God never, who never lies, promised before the ages began. Paul's whole ministry and the church's growth happens in the hope of eternal life. This hope is the strong foundation. It upholds every ministry. It upholds every Christian. It's what our faith and knowledge are built upon. This isn't hope like me hoping that I'll get a Five Guys hamburger tonight for dinner. It's not wishful thinking. It's confident expectation. It's knowing a certainty of what is to come. Our hope is surer than anything else that we could put our trust in. Our hope in God is confident. It's certain. It's even surer than my dinner plans for tonight. Eternal life is the hope of every Christian, but as Paul did and as he encourages, we must keep our eyes on our our hope, on eternal life. Part of what God uses to transform us is confidently keeping our eyes fixed on eternity. Knowing and trusting without a shadow of a doubt that we'll spend eternity in God's glorious presence. And nothing can change this hope. No one can take this hope away from us. But as you and I know, by tomorrow, our eyes might not be set on that hope anymore. Our lives are so, it's so easy to get distracted from thinking about eternity and hoping in eternity. It's easy to take our eyes off of it and to worry about the next thing, to worry about the next meeting that we have with our boss that makes us feel anxious, or that bill that we know that's coming that we're not sure how we're going to pay it all, or a difficult relationship where we know we're going to have a really hard conversation with someone. Or fears about your family and COVID and sickness. All these things, they're real fears. They're real things to be concerned about. They are challenges, but we have to face them with the light of the hope of eternal life in our hearts. It's what kept Paul going when he faced shipwrecks and imprisonments and lashings and beatings. The hope of eternal life. The hope of a life spent with God in His presence, freed from sin, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more sickness. It's, it's His hope, but it's also why He's reminding Titus of this, because He knows of the huge challenges that Titus faces in trying to help care for multiple churches on a difficult island of Crete. But how, how can we be so sure and so certain and so confident about this hope that we say that we have and that Paul says that he had. Well, verse 2 tells us it's because God promised it. God Himself promised this. This isn't Paul's promise. This is God's promise. And God never lies. When everything else seems to change around us, God never changes. He never changes His mind. He never takes back His promises. They are sure. They are certain. And so, this is an encouragement for us as a church. This is an encouragement for us. We have a hope that is sure, that is unshakable, that will never change, just like the God who promised it. And so, the author of Hebrews puts this unshakable promise of God in these terms. He says, we have this hope, this hope of eternal life, as an anchor for the soul, an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. What incredible words. 
What an incredible promise to have. An anchor to the soul that's firm and secure. Our hope of forgiveness of sin, our hope of eternity with God is anchored in the unchanging, eternal promise of God who never lies. Nothing could be more worthy of our trust and our hope. When the waves of uncertainty crash all around us and crash over us, this truth has to be the anchor of our souls. God has promised eternal life to all who trust in Him, and nothing, nothing, nothing at all in all of heaven or earth can change that fact. Not even God can change it because He's promised it, and God never lies. Not even God can change the certainty of our hope. And now look with me at verse 2 at the incredible scope of Paul's vision. He's not only looking forward to eternity. He's reaching back to before time began. This promise was God's eternal purpose before the world even existed. Before even time existed. God's eternal purpose for His chosen people was to grant them eternal life through His Son so that they could spend eternity with Him in ever-increasing bliss and joy. God's purpose from eternity past to eternity future was for His chosen people to dwell with Him in sure hope. That's incredible. That's incredible. And how is how is God going to accomplish such an incredible promise? Well, we see that in verse 3. At the proper time, the promise of God of eternal life was manifested. This promise of the hope of eternal life, it was revealed, manifested in His Word through the preaching that I, that's Paul, have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. How's God going to accomplish His amazing purposes for, from eternity past into eternity future? How is He going to save His chosen people to an eternal hope? It's through preaching, and specifically Paul's preaching of God's promise. That's Paul's summary of his whole ministry, preaching Christ, preaching the word of eternal life, the promise of hope. That was entrusted to him by God, our Savior. In other words, preaching the gospel. That's the power and that's the purpose of Paul's ministry. Paul's whole ministry is centered around proclaiming the same message from God that he had received over and over again in place after place. And those whom God had chosen would believe in it, would receive it, would have hope of eternal life. And they would gather together in churches and they would preach it again and again and again. That's the, the heart of this letter here that Paul wrote to Titus. And it's, Paul, it's what Paul wants for Titus and his ministry. It's what he wants for the churches of Crete to devote themselves to. And it's what every single church throughout history and time and cultures should spend their time on. It should be central for every church in the whole world. That's what we strive for here in Covenant Hope Church. It's to center our lives around this good news, this promise of eternal life and hope in God. If churches want to be faithful, if they want to flourish spiritually, rather than entertaining people and growing crowds and following new trends, their whole focus should be spent on declaring and defending the good news that Paul was entrusted by God our Savior and living it out in their lives together. That is the, that's the secret source to Christian flourishing and churches flourishing, is gospel-centered living and preaching. This gospel that I keep referring to was God's plan from before time began. It was promised in eternity past that God would choose a people. He would have His elect, people from every tribe and tongue and race and nation and family, And they would be saved to be His children through sending His Son. The Lord Jesus came to accomplish this, to to, to have victory over sin, 
and to accomplish this plan of salvation that was planned before the earth began? Because everybody on earth had fallen short. Every one of us has sinned against a holy God. We've rebelled. We've been disobedient and enslaved to various passions and pleasures, he's going to say later in the letter. We've all rebelled against God. We've all fallen short of the glory that He deserves. We've rebelled against Him, and so we deserve judgment for our sins. We deserve God's righteous judgment in hell. And yet God, in His grace and in His love, planned to save guilty sinners so that they could be counted righteous in His sight through His Son, Jesus. And so Jesus came to die the death penalty that sinners like you and I deserve, to pay for sin's debt in full and to rise from the grave to show that it had been paid and to promise eternal life because He has risen and He will never die again. If you're not a Christian, this good news, this gospel message is, is offered to all. It's offered to you. And so, if you're not a Christian, you can believe this today. All it requires is trusting in this good news, taking it and in, in your heart, believing it, and receiving the gift of eternal life. But the amazing thing about this gospel is that this truth doesn't just save us from the judgment that we deserve. It doesn't just save us from the fires of hell. It transforms us as well. The gospel is not just a get-out-of-jail-free card, it's a promise of a life transformed to be new, to be set free from the slavery to sin that we were once bound by, to be set free from the shackles of temptation and sin that so entangle us. And so as you seek to grow in godliness, don't leave the gospel behind. As one pastor put it, you never graduate from the gospel. We don't move on to some new trend or something better than this. Paul encourages Titus to focus on this in the churches in Crete, and he tells every church to do this. He says it to the church in uh, Colossae. He says, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. The gospel transforms us from the inside out. It produces godliness in us. It makes us new, but it also doesn't stop there. The gospel transforms not only us individually, but it transforms our relationships. And we see that in our second and final point, which will be much shorter than the first, in verse 4 where we see how Paul addresses Titus. He says to Titus, my true child in a common faith. You can tell the affection and the love that Paul had for his friend Titus. He says, my true child. He's so affectionately referring to Titus as if he was his father. Titus was, in fact, a Greek by birth. He wasn't a Jew like Paul, and so when Paul was before his conversion, when he was very zealous, he would have had nothing to do with Titus at all. But now he considers Titus as his own child, his own family. Titus had served side by side with Paul in ministry, and now he'd been entrusted with serving the churches of Crete too, to see the same faith that he and Paul shared together flourish there as well, so that the churches of Crete would know the same hope and the same promise and the same salvation that Paul and Titus had through faith. You see, the gospel doesn't only transform us personally, it transforms us communally as well. Through our faith in Christ, we are united to God and we're united to one another. Paul becomes our father in the faith, just like he was Titus's. And Titus becomes our brother. We'll look forward to one day meeting them face to face when we're all gathered together. We're saved into a gospel family with brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers and children in the faith. 
that's really at the heart of the biggest opposition that Titus was going to face as he traveled from church to church in Crete. There were false teachers who were traveling around and they were arguing that one must become a Jew in order to be part of the family of God. But Paul here reminds Titus that despite his different heritage, despite not being a Jew, he's a true child because he shares in the same faith as Paul. Faith in Christ, faith that unites Christians all over the world and from all time. No matter where you're born, no matter what your background is, no matter what faith you were raised in or lack of faith, those who have true faith in Christ are all part of God's family. And what this means for us is that the gospel has created a new family for us, a supernatural family. If you have faith in Christ, you have become part of the same eternal family with me as your brother whether you like it or not, whether we have a lot of things in common, that we like a lot of things in common, or whether we like nothing in common other than Christ alone. And this transformed identity, it knits our lives together as believers, especially in the context of local churches, just like the ones that Titus was serving and Paul had preached to and that we here have at Covenant Hope. So let me ask you, is this how you think about your fellow members at Covenant Hope Church? Do you consider the brothers and sisters here closer than people who share the same passport as you, the same hobbies as you, the same interests as you, but they don't know God? Do you consider the members Closer to you than friends that you've had from maybe very, very early childhood who aren't trusting in Christ? Do you consider them even closer than your own flesh and blood, your own immediate family members who reject Jesus? That's how we should think about one another here in this church. That's what the gospel has done. Truly, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We've been transformed into being children of God. We have a whole family of brothers and sisters and mums and dads. And we'll see this develop even further in chapter 2 where Paul addresses all kinds of different people, men and women, older and younger, slave and free or bondservant and free. All are part of the same family and we need each other. We need each other's help to grow in godliness, to know the truth, to grow in our faith. And it's this gospel truth that brings us into a gospel family where we disciple one another into greater godliness. Christian relationships between people who have nothing else but Christ in common actually demonstrates the power of this message that Paul proclaims. The power of the gospel, it shows the world the incredible beauty of God's grace when he transforms sinners into saints, and strangers into beloved brothers and sisters. When a culture of discipleship like that that's laid out in this letter occurs and develops, where Christians are, who are very unlike one another take steps to help each other grow in following Jesus, the whole family flourishes and grows up into maturity in Christ. That's the vision that we're going to see laid out in this letter, but we see it here even in the tender words that Paul gives to Titus in saying, my true child in a common faith. And so let me give you one final encouragement for this new year, maybe one resolution to add to your list. If you aren't already doing this, I want to encourage you to build a relationship with a member in our church who is as unlike you as possible. Build a relationship with a member who's not like you. Maybe they're a different age to you. If you're younger, look for someone uh, older than you, much older. We don't have too many of them in our church, but look for them, hunt them down. Or maybe someone from just a different place in the world to you, someone who's from a different nationality. Be brave. Ask them to get together with you with the sole purpose of helping one another follow Jesus together. Or maybe, maybe choose someone who's from a different kind of work to you, a different kind of social position to you, 
Maybe they're in a different season of life to you. Or maybe all of the above. Find them and invest in one another to help grow in godliness together. And finally, Paul concludes his greeting with these words. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord, our Savior, sorry. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Paul knows that the gospel advances in our lives through and through us in the lives of others only by God's initiative, only by God's grace. And so he asks the Lord to give grace and peace to Titus in his ministry. All of the transformation that we would see in our lives is an undeserved gift from God, just like our salvation. What an incredible prayer that we can make our own to pray for one another that God would give us grace and peace here at Covenant Hope. And while this opening of this letter is from Paul to Titus, we see that God and his gospel are really at the center of it all. It's God who's mentioned most in these verses. It's God whom Paul serves. It's God who promised eternal life before the world began. It's God who never lies. It's God who revealed the gospel through Paul's preaching. It's God who is our Savior. It's God who gives grace. It's God who gives peace. And he gives it to us in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let's go to him together now in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you praise and we thank you that you are a ki- this kind of God, that you give grace, you give peace, that you show us love, that even in your wisdom before, the, before time began, you had made a promise to deliver and save your people, your chosen people, to an eternal hope that cannot be taken away. And that in your grace, you've made a way for us to be transformed, to become more like you, to grow in godliness. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us as a church to be growing in faith, in knowledge of the truth, and that it would produce godliness in our lives together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.